I'd like to welcome you all to the College of Complexes tonight. My name is Tim. I'd like the College of Complexes consists of the following format. One will have a brief announcements period. Thank you. The second part will have our speakers who will then speak up to an hour. Then we will have our question and answer period. And after our question and answer period, we'll then have our rebuttal period where you'll be able to speak on or off subject and rebut the speakers. The speakers will then get the last word. We have to be out of here by 845 in the building. Uh, so, you know, we have to be out of here by 845 because the restaurant closes at 9. They do need a little time to clean. The College of Complexes has two very simple rules. One is one fool at a time, and the second is no personal attacks. All right, tonight our topic will be HR1 for the People Act, an act of 2019. It'll cover the public financing of campaigns, the disclosing of tax returns, and voting rights and procedures. Were you ready, ladies? The uh, Northwest Suburbs Organizing for Action will present a short, nonpartisan presentation on why the issues covered in HR1 are important for all Americans to know about and reasons to support it. HR1 is a far-reaching bill and that the presentation includes three short videos and summarizes HR1. To introduce the bill, we have Edward T. Spire and Jim McGrath. Let's welcome both individuals with a rousing round of applause. Yeah! Okay, is that, uh, okay, can you guys hear, first of all, th thanks for coming, uh, thanks for uh, inviting us to uh, tonight, so as uh, announced, we're from Northwest Suburbs Organizing for Action, we're located basically in the Palatine area. Um, we have several groups, it sounds like you guys do as well, that uh, address different issues. And I, I don't know if you can really see this, but uh, I'm going to kind of squeeze over here a little bit. We've got a group that does social justice, another group that does gun violence. That's how Ed and I both got started in activism. We both got involved with uh, gun violence awareness. And we've been down to Springfield for lobby days and stuff like that. Um, We've got a climate change group, um, very, you know, we get speakers in from Citizens Climate Lobby, a Sierra Club, etc. cetera. Um, we got a fiscal and economics group that meets once a month. Pretty much all of these groups meet once a month and they talk about fiscal issues uh, and how things have changed in the last couple of years. You can imagine what, what, what they're talking about there. Uh, we have a group, uh, uh, immigration reform, um, basically heading up, targeting the what's going on at the border. Um, we, a group with Stand With Women, uh, trying to get issues involving women's rights and the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, we've got one more state, one more state to approve the Equal Rights Amendment. I don't know if you guys know, it hasn't been approved yet. I, I thought that was done years ago, but it's not. We, we have a health care group, and then Ed and I are we're doing this restore our democracy. Um, Ed has developed this, this presentation. Um, we we'll call it uh, it's HR1, but HR1 is so big. We, this presentation is going to pretty much focus on the uh, finance in the money and politics side side of HR1. So uh, interestingly, I, I was lucky enough to talk to Roger Roger Krishnamurthy. Uh, Wednesday night and I talked to him about what we're doing and he basically said HR1 is more a set of goals we don't really expect it to ever get passed although the house did pass HR1 it's in the Senate Moscow Mitch will probably never put it on the floor for a vote but uh, anyway uh, so we're gonna we're gonna tackle one part of this tonight no I'm gonna use the uh, I'm gonna use the uh, the system here. So, um, I'm a son of a Chicago cop. I grew up here, I went to the St. Pat's High, went to U of, C, uh, U of I at Circle Campus, got a degree in uh, physics, but I learned to use a computer, so I spent my career in computers. 
and I run small businesses, I've been involved in public companies, and I see a bunch of stuff that doesn't make me very happy. Uh, and so I want to talk to you about what money in politics does to our system and how we can do something about it. And that's why I'm really one of the reasons this is a hot topic now is because of HR1. HR1 is has got a lot of stuff in it that would solve a lot of the problems I'm going to talk about today. So, so I want to talk about what kind of government we have uh, and whether we believe it's doing what we want it to do. If it's not, why not? And, and what can we do about it? And, and there's a bunch of organizations already working on the kind of things I'm going to tell you about tonight. Um, as I mentioned, HR1 has got a lot to do with this because uh, um, it would if we actually end up implemented it, implemented it, it probably would solve a lot of these problems we're talking about. So what could we do to, to help get it implemented, even though, as Jim said, it's probably not going to get implemented by Congress in its current form, but that doesn't mean that it's hopeless. So so first let me talk about what kind of government we have. I and mean, I hear a lot of people talk about whether we have a democracy or not, especially when it comes to talking about the presidential election, how in the world can we have somebody be president when he when the other person got through all more votes. And a lot of times people will say, oh, that's because we're not a democracy, we're a republic. Well, you know, if you look up what the word republic means, all it really means is not a monarchy. It means there's not some overarching power. The people are the, pe are the power in the country. So that's really what republic means. And in fact, we've always been a democratic republic. In fact, we're a, a representative democracy. And what that means is, you know, we're not a direct democracy. We don't all vote on everything. And that, that wouldn't work in a big country. Might might have worked in ancient Greece. Might work in a little New England town. But it can't work in a huge country. So, so we have representatives. They publish a platform. They tell us what they would do if we vote for them. And we hopefully choose to vote for people based on their platform. And and then they go off to Washington. And and do they do what? They said we're going to do. Does our democracy work? Do we get what we want out of our democracy? And you know, I'm a I'm an engineer. I'm an engineering degree. A lot of people feel like we don't get what we expect from our democracy. But as an engineer, I want to measure stuff. I, I don't believe we can fully understand something unless we measure it. Especially if we're going to make a change, we won't know if our change helped or hurt if we can't measure what's going on. And we could measure this. We could measure what public opinion thinks about. Topics. We have Pew and Gallup. They measure those kind of things. It's pretty reliable. And we can look at what Congress does. And we could compare the two. Now, Princeton did that exact study. Princeton covered several decades of public opinion and compared it to what Congress actually implemented. And the result of that study basically is that Congress doesn't really care what we think. Uh, and I've got a short video. I've got three short videos. The first one is going to talk to you about that particular study and show you how it shows uh, what, we, what the Congress doesn't care what we think. Now we're going to dim the lights a little bit. I hope you can still see your phone. We can't. But uh, you got to be able to see this video because these videos are an important part of this presentation. For the last few years, I've had this sense that everything I learned as a kid about how America's government works is completely wrong. But I had no idea how bad things actually were until I saw this one graph. Researchers at Princeton University looked at more than 20 years worth of data to answer a pretty simple question. Does the government represent the people? Now, this is what they found. This axis here represents public support for any given idea. On the left, at 0%, are ideas that not a single American wants. On the right, at 100%, are ideas that everyone supports. This axis represents the likelihood of Congress passing a law that reflects any of these ideas, from a 0 to a 100% chance. On this graph, an ideal republic would look like this. If 50% of the public supports an idea, there's a 50% chance of it becoming law. If 80% of us support something, there's an 80% chance. You get the idea. Now, most Americans would probably agree that, with a few exceptions, we should be as close to this ideal as possible. Unfortunately, the way America actually works doesn't even come close. Take an idea that nobody supports, literally nobody, and it has about a 30% chance of becoming federal law. Now, take an incredibly popular idea, the most popular idea this country has ever seen, and there's also about a 30% chance of it becoming law. This means that the number of American voters 
for or against any idea has no impact on the likelihood that Congress will make it law. Put another way, and I'm just going to quote the Princeton study directly here, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, of statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. So if you've ever felt like your opinion doesn't matter and that the government doesn't really care what you think, well, you're right. But there's a catch. This flat line only accounts for the bottom 90% of income earners in America. Economic elites, business interests, people who can afford lobbyists, they get their own line. Look at how much closer their line is to the ideal. When they want something, the government is much more likely to do it. And when they don't, they have the power to completely block it from happening, no matter how much the rest of the country supports it. They get what they want, and guess who ends up paying for it? We pay for it with the most expensive healthcare in the world. We pay for it with a tax code that's a complete mess. We pay for it with internet that's slower and more expensive, with wasteful spending, a floundering education system, a catastrophic drug war, and one in five American children born into poverty. Almost every major issue we face as a nation is traced back to this graph. How does this happen? Well, just follow the money. Right now, it's perfectly legal to buy political influence in America. Here's how it works. Let's say a big bank wants a law that would force taxpayers to bail them out again if they repeat the exact same reckless <coughs> behavior that crashed the global economy in 2008. Not exactly the most popular idea with the public, and Congress knows that. That should be the end of it. But that's where the money comes in. It's perfectly legal for our bank to hire a team of lobbyists whose entire job is to make sure that the government gives the bank what it wants. Then those lobbyists can track down members of Congress who regulate banks and help raise a ton of money for their re-election campaigns. It's perfectly legal for those lobbyists to offer those same politicians million dollar jobs at their lobbying firm. Then those lobbyists can literally write the language of this new bailout law themselves and hand it off to the politician they just buttered up with campaign money and lucrative job offers. And it's perfectly legal for those politicians to take the lobbyist written language and sneak it through Congress at the last second. So now you've got a law that greatly benefits the banks and the whole process can start over. This is how a bill becomes a law. A special interest hires some lobbyists, those lobbyists collect campaign contributions, offer jobs, and then write the laws that Congress then passes to help those same special interests. This happens every day on every single issue with politicians of both parties. In the last five years alone, the 200 most politically active companies in the United States spent $5.8 billion influencing your government. Those same companies got 4.4 trillion in taxpayer support. And that's trillion, with a T. And that's just the top 200 companies. Never mind every other special interest, every union, every trade association, and every billionaire. Every single one of them can use their money to buy political influence. You know, there's this idea out there that this only became a problem after the Supreme Court Citizens United decision in 2010. But the data goes back almost 40 years, and the results are clear. Corruption is legal in America. And as long as it is, anyone who can spend money to buy political influence will. The solution here isn't rocket science. Make corruption illegal. We already know Congress won't do it. I mean, one look at this chart will tell you that. What we need is a plan that lets us go around Congress and do what the American people do best. Fix this mess ourselves. Well, good news. We have that plan and it's already working. Now that we've got the problem covered, let us show you how to be part of the solution. So that does a pretty good job. That does a pretty good job of describing the problem of money in politics when people can spend as much money as they want uh, in any way they want, pretty much, uh, to influence our government. And um, this has been going on for 40 years. In fact, we know when it started. I'm going to tell you when and how this started. We had a very idealistic young president who had a vision of a better America, but uh, he was killed before he had the opportunity to put much of it in practice. His vice president, who knew Congress really well, implemented some of his stuff. He implemented civil rights legislation, even though he was from Texas. He implemented uh, Medicare, I believe. Yes. Um, and business interests 
didn't really like this stuff because it's regulation and the taxes were cutting into their profits. Now when the next president came along from the other party, business interests expected him to roll some of that stuff back, just the same way that the current guy is rolling back what the last guy did. But he didn't. As far as business is concerned, he made it worse because he implemented the EPA, more regulation and more taxes. That's when the business community decided they couldn't trust either political party to look out for their interests and started spending money on lobbyists. There wasn't much money spent on lobbyists than all these huge campaign donations before the Nixon period, but it was after Nixon that this stuff started getting worse and worse every year. So there's uh, a lot of ideas about what we can do about this, and there's a bunch of different organizations working on it. Um, you've got um, here. You've got the idea that a constitutional amendment would solve this. That's really hard to do, and as, as probably wouldn't solve all of it anyway. Uh, you can do some legislation, uh, and I, I think that that's really a better way to, to go, which is why H.R. 1 is so important, because H.R. 1 has quite a bit in it that could address this problem. So here's another short video for you that talks about how we can get a handle on this. So here's a crazy thing. Almost everyone I know agrees that the government of the United States, the government of the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, is completely broke. And for most of us, it's really obvious why. Lobbyists write our laws, politicians are bought, and corruption is infecting every issue that's close to our hearts. But what's even crazier is that we've all convinced ourselves that there's nothing we can do about it. And that is one of the biggest and most dangerous lies in American politics. The problem isn't that corrupt politicians are breaking the law. The problem is that we don't even have laws for them to break. Right now, corruption is legal in America. And that is something we can fix. Here's exactly how we do it. Right now, it's perfectly legal for special interests to hand huge checks to the members of Congress who regulate them. It's perfectly legal for those same members of Congress to pass laws to help out lobbyists who offer them a cushy job when they leave office. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. From million-dollar bundlers to the threat of a super PAC smear campaign, there are literally dozens of perfectly legal ways to buy a public official. But that makes the solution pretty obvious. Make corruption illegal. All of it. And that is where the American Anti-Corruption Act comes in. It introduces a strict set of ethical standards. So if you're an elected official on, say, the Senate Banking Committee, you can't take donations from banking lobbyists. It mandates full transparency so the American people know exactly who's trying to buy our elected officials. It changes how elections are funded so clean candidates can win without selling out to special interests. And it does all of this while protecting the people's right to free speech. That's because the act was written by top constitutional scholars, conservative and liberal alike, to stand up to the toughest scrutiny. You can read the full text of the act at anticorruptionact.org. And speaking of the Constitution, let's talk about a little Supreme Court ruling called Citizens United. Here's the thing. While a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United would help clamp down on those shady groups with names like Americans for Freedom and Jobs and More Freedom, it wouldn't fix any of the problems we talked about before. You could pass that amendment tomorrow and the bribery, the extortion, the conflicts of interest, all of it would still be legal. But in a weird way, that's actually good news because it means we can solve a huge part of this problem with a plain old law. The question is... The question is how? And this video was produced before H.R. 1, before the Democrats got control of the House, before H.R. 1 was passed. And in fact, that American Anti-Corruption Act is essentially one of the models for a good part of H.R. 1. Most of, most of what's in the Anti-Corruption Act that these guys proposed is in H.R. 1 that the House passed. So um, there's, there's a, a lot going on here, and there's a lot of organizations working on trying to do something about it in different manners. We have general organizations uh, that just take general approaches like um, Indivisible, our group is part of Indivisible, the League of the Voters, people from the American Way are, are working on corruption issues uh, in a general manner. But there are some specific groups. Uh, Common Cause is really working very, very hard on uh, ranked choice voting right now. There's a group called American Promise, which is working to try and get Congress to do a constitutional amendment. 
there's a group called the WOPAC, which is trying to get a constitutional convention started so we can propose amendments to the Constitution without Congress. And there's uh, this group represented on us, which is the group that produced these videos I'm showing you. Their point of view is to take local action at the local and state level. So there's, there's a lot of different groups working on this. They don't work together very well. Some of them are kind of disdainful of the others, which is kind of a shame. Uh, but our, my point, my viewpoint is that uh, if we learn about these issues and, and we become involved, uh, we can make some progress. Now, the <coughs> HR1 can be the foundation of that progress. Uh, HR1 is an enormous bill. Um, and in fact, well, it's got three major sections. There's a section on uh, voting rights uh, that includes ballot access, it includes um, um, election security, there's a section on uh, campaign finance reform that includes donor matching, includes voucher programs, it includes public financing, it includes transparency, and there's a, a, a whole section on ethics as well that, that, produces, that brings up ethical requirements for the administration, for members of Congress, even for the judiciary. It is an enormous, an enormous bill. One of the things that you heard addressed earlier today is that it's kind of like a statement of principle. It's what you should expect from the Democrats if the Democrats could actually get it done by having both houses of Congress with uh, enough people to get past the filibuster and the administration. But it's so big, it probably is not ever going to get passed. You know, one of the things that Jim and I, Jim mentioned that we were both, we're both involved in, in um, gun violence prevention. We've made some real progress here in Illinois in the last couple of years in gun violence prevention. We've um, passed a, uh, a gun dealer licensing bill so that we can enforce uh, gun dealer uh, uh, licensing requirements that are on the books for the federal government, but they won't fund enforcement, so they are enforced until us, unless we pass our own law and we enforce it. We passed a red flag law, uh, we passed a waiting period law, we're working on uh, improvements to our FOID system. And the way we, you know, the way you do it is not to pass, not to put up one big bill that's got everything in it. Because if you put up one huge bill, somebody's going to find a problem with something in there. You're never going to get everybody to agree to everything. So you take one thing at a time, and you pass, you build a consensus around one point, and you pass, you work, work your butt off to pass that, and you take the next thing. And you build a different consensus. It's probably some different people. It might be the same people, but it might be a different group. Uh, and you pass that. You do things one at a time. So the thing that we think ought to be done here is to take pieces of H.R. 1. Now I've got, if you want to get into the details of H.R. 1, after the end, after my ending slide and presentation, I've got about another hundred slides. Because I have read the entire bill, I have uh, summarized the bill in about nine slides, and then I've got details on the bill. So if, if there's any specific question on HR1, we can find the section, we can put it up on the screen, we can see exactly what it says. Um, but suffice to say that um, as it is, it's not going to get passed. So so what do we do about that? Uh, how can we get any of this implemented? Well, here's, um, here's one more thing that I'm going to show you that talks about how we can get this implemented, even though Congress, the federal Congress, it is never going to do it. So, one more short video. This is very short. So, first of all, the U.S. Constitution gives states sole control over how elections are run, even federal elections. So when we fix gerrymandering or election laws, that fixes the federal election in each state. That means that by going state by state, we have an immediate impact on how we elect Congress and how we hold them accountable. But there's more, and that brings us to our second line. This line is from a Bloomberg News study. It finds that throughout American history, passing state laws leads to federal victory. Let me show you what I mean. This chart shows the number of states over time that pass laws giving women the right to vote. When it hits the right side of the chart, that's the federal victory. Okay, now I want you to watch the blue line. We're gonna do this again with interracial marriage. There were a few states in the Northeast that made it legal decades ago, centuries go by, and we hit this blue line where all of a sudden there's a rush of activity, which leads pretty quickly to federal passage. So here we are again with same-sex marriage. 
one state, Massachusetts, for many years. A couple decades later, we hit that blue line, a jump in state activity and federal passage. This isn't about these issues. This is about a winning political strategy. The crucial finding in the Bloomberg study is that a key event, often a court decision or a grassroots campaign reaching maturity, triggers a rush of state activity that ultimately leads to a change in federal law. So that's the, the thing, the phrase that I get out of there is always this one, a grassroots campaign reaching maturity. Now we don't have a big grassroots campaign about ethics and government right now. We should, but we don't. So. Right now, the group that, that Jim and I are running are working on building public awareness and trying to get a grassroots campaign started in this area so that we can help people understand that we don't have to take this. We can do some things about it. We can work at a lower level. We can work at the city, county, and state level. And Jim and I understand that you can make stuff happen at the state, at the state level. We just did it with gun violence prevention. But we had a coalition of 50 civic groups working with us because there is a grass move, grass movement. There's groups like Moms Demand Action that have more members than, they are, than they are the NRA now. So we can do things at the state level. I can drive to Springfield in the morning and spend a day lobbying con uh, con congressmen down there in Springfield. I can't do that very, very easily at the, at the federal level. We can make stuff happen in our cities and our states. And we could use HR1 as a template. We could take the most important parts of HR1 for our state or our city and propose it as legislation. That's going to be our second step. Our second step is going to it's going to try and build some momentum and get enough pressure so that we can start doing some things in Springfield. But right now we're mostly working on public awareness. So this approach does work. It, it has worked in a bunch of areas. There's Five states that recently have put in citizen commissions to do uh, redistricting instead of allowing the politicians to, to choose the voters. There are ethnic legislations that are going up in red states as well as blue states. South Dakota, Alaska passed an ethics legislation. Um, you have campaign refinance reform working mostly at the city level. It's been in, it's been, public financing has been around in New York City for decades of uh, seven to one matching so that if you, rep, if you can prove that you have some public support, the government will help you have enough money to run an effective campaign without your having to spend every waking hour raising money. Uh, there's uh, certainly improvements in voter access in some states. Uh, ranked choice voting is actually implemented in Maine and in, in um, a few cities, uh, several cities use it at the municipal level. Um, NPVIC, anybody in here know what NPVIC is? No. Okay, I'm going to tell you. NPVIC is the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. It's a way to make the Electoral College do what we want it to do. And what we want it to do is hand the presidency to the person who got the most votes in the country. So the way NPVIC works is it's an interstate compact. It's a bunch of states that get together and they make a deal. And the deal is they will not allocate their electoral votes based on anything that happens inside their state. It won't be win or take all in the state or anything like that. It'll be them allocate their electoral college votes to the person who won the popular vote in the nation. Now this deal doesn't go into effect until you got enough states to comprise 270 electoral votes. And we're about three quarters of the way there. Illinois is already in this deal. So we need a few more states. I think within 10 years we'll have enough states that this will be effective. And what that means is that the winner of the popular vote will become president, period. So this state-by-state state stuff can make a real difference, and it is working, and we can make it work in, in this area as well. Now, that, I mean, you know, one, one thing you got to think about is what should we tackle here in Illinois? Now, if you look at all the stuff in HR1, there's a few things that we really should do. I mean, there's a lot in there about voter access, and I gotta tell you, I'm an election judge, I'm an election equipment manager in Cook County. I understand elections really well. And, you know, some people might think poorly of elections in Chicago, but we got a pretty good electoral system here in Illinois. You have four weeks of early voting. <clears throat> no excuse mail voting. You can register on Tuesday. 
you don't have to declare a party when you register. And if you've got a driver's license, you can register online just with your driver's license. You don't need to prove residence or anything. So there's not a whole lot. There's a bunch of stuff in HR1 that a lot of red states should do, but we've already done most of that stuff. And in fact, the guy that did a lot of that stuff, this guy's name is Noah Press. He was the director of uh, elections for Cook County. He now works for the Department of Homeland Security. His job is now go around to different states and help them understand how to secure their back end, to secure their not just their equipment, but the, the back end counting stuff. And I got a I got a really interesting story here for you about that. Um, I just participated last week in a in a rally downtown where we were trying to convince McConnell to spring some cash for election security. The House had voted six hundred million for election security. McConnell wouldn't move it. Public Citizen organized a day of action with rallies in cities across the nation. We did one. We did one, which is one of the biggest ones, even though we only had 50 people. One, one news outfit showed up. Not the one I wanted. The one that showed up was Fox 32. But anyway, at the end of the day, McConnell agreed to 250 million. And, and the next day, Durbin called us up and said he wanted to come. Up. He, wanted, he wanted to talk to us. So we went to talk to Durbin. He told us he was surprised that McConnell popped for anything. He thanked us for the pressure. And then we were talking about this and that. And he said, the thing that worries me most is not that some voting machines might be hacked and some votes might be flipped. The thing that worries him most is that if there's an attack on the back end counting systems on Tuesday and he can't report results, that somebody who loses might say, I don't trust the results because, because the counting was screwed up. So that makes me think, and I vote, yeah, as an election judge, I always think about the equipment. Is this touchscreen work? Is it lined up? Do you push here and get that vote? Is there any chance it's been hacked? Is it sealed? You know, the, the machines come with numeric seals on them. Every morning you check the machine and make sure the seal's not broken so you know nobody's screwed with it. Well, now I'm thinking security on the back end is probably more important than the machines because if Durbin's losing sleep over something, that's probably as important. Well, anyway, so voting is probably not an area where we need to do a lot, but campaign finance reform, hey, we just had the most expensive gubernatorial race in the nation, uh, in, in history of the nation. So yeah, campaign finance reform is probably something that Illinois should tackle. Ethics, how many governors go to jail? Uh, Ethics is probably something the state of Illinois should tackle as well. So you know, we, we need to think about the things that are important in our situation and find ways to get our politicians here in our cities, in our state, to, to pay attention. Um, you know, um, what you said about tax, about elections is, is interesting too. Um, suppose we had a law that said you got to disclose your income tax forms before you can be on the ballot. Wouldn't that be interesting? California passed a law like that. I don't know why they did what they did, but they passed a law that says you can't be on the primary ballot unless you uh, disclose your tax returns. And some federal judge immediately said, no, that, you can't do that because that adds additional requirements to uh, what it takes, what the requirements are to be president. You know, you got to be 35, you got to be a natural born citizen. Now you got to disclose your tax returns. That's not in the Constitution. But then somebody else says, now wait a minute, we require um, 50,000 signatures from state, um, from state voters before you can get your name on the ballot. Why is that unconstitutional? Why is that constitutional but disclosing your tax returns is not? So that issue is probably going to go up to the Supreme Court. But it's another example of how states can take local action that will help the country as a whole. So my call to action is to become aware of this stuff and to get involved. Get involved by, by joining us or joining any one of those groups I mentioned uh, in, in this effort. Um, you can uh, help spread the word. Uh, I am willing to go pretty much anywhere and talk to people about this kind of stuff. Civic groups, church groups, anybody. Uh, five, five people in your living room, I'll show up because this is, my, this is my thing now. I'm retired now, and this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And, and I hope to make some progress in the rest of my life. I've got 30 years left. Um, so um, let's see now. You can write your legislators if you want. One very effective thing that we do in the gun violence area is we go visit our legislators. But not just, you know, I went, but not just by myself. I went with a gun violence expert sitting next to me. And you go in, I went in to see Don D'Amico. And, and I said, I'm, I'm your constituent. I vote for you. I worry about gun violence and what we're going to do to fix it. This person knows how to fix it. Listen to her. It was there. 
So then she talks for a while, and then they talk. And then we're all done. I say, okay, do what she said, and I'll vote for you again. So, you know, I will go with you, any of you that wants to go and talk to your legislators about this stuff. I'll go and sit in the expert seat while you can say, listen to this guy, and I'll tell him what, what we think. So that's, that's something we can do. Um, this is so far we can't read it. Oh, you know, get your friends involved, get your neighbors involved. Um, if you want to do more than that, you can actually take action. Represent Us does phone banking and text banking to other states. So that if you want, you can be sitting in your living room, looking at your computer, calling people that they give you the phone number for, pitching these kinds of things. The Wolfpack does this too. They'll, they'll target a state or a city, and they'll, they'll get people from all across the nation, mostly kids, to make phone college kids, a lot of these people are college kids, uh, to make phone calls into this, into this state, to try and encourage them to work on a piece of legislation that we know is up for, for voting in their state. Um, and by the way, you know, a lot of, as I said, a lot of, a lot of the most active people are college kids. It's, there's, two, there's two groups that are very active, college kids and retired people, because they got the time. People that are working for a living generally don't have the time to do this stuff. But um, and, and when I went through a fellowship program, I went through a fellowship program with uh, Organizing for Action. Their their stated goal was to raise up the new group of community actors, community organizers, because that's what Obama was originally. But everybody who's doing anything is retired. We're we're all, all almost everybody in Northwest uh, Urban is, is somebody retired who's taken what they've learned in business, taken their their experience, their life experience, and and putting it towards some issue, this issue, or gun violence, or uh, women's rights, or what have you. So you can, you can get involved in a group like, uh, like Represent.us, or like the Wolf Pack. Um, you can, uh, you know about witness slips. Here's another one. Anybody here know what a witness slip is? Okay, one person. I'm going to tell you what a witness slip is. Here in Illinois, we have a very unique way of communicating with our legislature. When a bill is going to be debated in the legislature, they enable a thing on the, on the state website where you can express your opinion on that bill. And you can go in there and say, on this bill, I support it or I do not support it. And the way this used to work with gun violence is any time a gun violence, a gun, gun control bill would come up, the Illinois Rifle Association, the NRA, would spread the word to all the members. They'd all get on the internet and they'd all say, no, we don't want to do this. So then they'd get in the committee and the committee chairman would look at the IT guy and say, so what are the witness slip counts? And the chair of the IT guy would say, oh, I got the four people in favor and 110 against. And so then they say, okay, next bill, we're not going to do that. Because they, they care about what we think in that sense because they want to get reelected. So, once we got Moms Demand Action going, and we got more people with, you know, all these moms with their torches and pitchforks out yelling at people, um, and we got our own network going. So now, when, when one of these things comes up, and the Illinois Rifle Association gets their guys to vote, we all get our people to vote. They had one, last time I remember one, um, I, the word went out that the Illinois Rifle Association has 500 votes against something, and we only had 304. They said, I want 1,000 votes overnight. And we did it. We did it. We ended up with 2,000 votes for to their 500 against, and the bill was passed. So witness slips are an important thing, and it's very easy. If you register with them, if you tell them who you are, where you live, and all that stuff, you can do a witness slip just like this. You just, you just click on the link for the thing, you scroll down, you say, I agree to this one, and you click submit, and you're done. It's very simple because that's you're already logged in and they know who you are and all the other fields are filled out for you on So that's something if you want to become politically active in any area here in Illinois with our state government, you need to learn about witness lists. So um, you can join our group, you can help us get the word out. Um, the thing we learned with gun violence is that the way to get a grassroots movement to come to fruition is to build a coalition. So as the presentation said, many of our issues are, are poor support for public schools, 
our lack of a national health care program. Uh, a lot of the issues that face us uh, are due to the corrupting influence of unlimited political money to getting Congress to do what a few people want instead of what all of us want. So almost any group that's worried about something could be a, in coalition with us. They understand that this stuff is underlying their issue. And if we can build the kind of coalition that the gun violence people built over the last 20 years, we can have real impact in, in Illinois. So we're thinking about that, and we're curious to think about if any of you have any ideas along those lines. I'm curious about whatever ideas you guys have. What, whatever your questions are, what your thoughts are, um, about I'm very experienced with the election process. Uh, we can go off topic and talk about that if you want. Uh, we, we have some slides in here about gerrymandering if you want to talk about that. As I said, I got every detail you'd ever want to know about HR1 in here. And uh, I'd be curious what makes sense to you. I'm done. That's, that's what I got to say. Okay. First question for you. Now you'll be calling on people for you. I would like to know, I would like to know why you guys, a little bit about your own background and why you have gotten into this. And if you could both answer that question, that would be much appreciated. Sure. Uh, as I mentioned, um, I spent my career in software. I um, started a couple of, I did, I started out working here at the AMA and Standard Oil. Uh, I got pretty deep into some very technical stuff. And um, we, we saw an opportunity in part my partner, who I'm no longer partner with, the guy I was partnered with at the time got a small business started here. We made about 20 jobs. Um, we did we had two little businesses. Um, then I had, and, and I made some money. Uh, not a lot, I made some money. Then I had the opportunity to go down to Houston and participate in an IPO. A guy that I had worked with at Standard had gone around here and there, here and there, and done a few things, and he got a business started in, in Houston they were going to take public. So I went down there and I helped them take a company public. And uh, I didn't like a lot of stuff I saw. First of all, the original owner, you know, the original owners, they got to take money from venture capitalists to get the thing started. So then the venture capitalists, they push out the original owners and they bring in a team of executives whose sole job is to make the company look good and sell it to Wall Street. To hype it, to make it look better than it really is. And convince Wall Street to, to take it public, which they did. I made a bunch of money, but I didn't feel great about it because it wasn't really worth what they sold it for. And so the stock goes up. Then the market figures out it's not really worth what they sold it for. The stock goes down. But you know, at this point, we, we made several hundred jobs. Heck, at this point, I was I was managing 200 software engineers in Chicago. No, in, excuse me, mostly in Houston and in, in Silicon Valley. Well, when the stock goes down, then it become you become meat for the vultures and the private enter, the, the private equity people take you over. Then they buy up all the stock, they take the company and they milk it. They reduce expenses as much as possible. In my case, that meant moving all my engineering jobs to India. So I get to go to India several times a year and train replacements for the people I had to lay off. So the venture capitalists made a boatload of money. I almost used the word that started with S. They made a boatload of money by destroying this company, by removing jobs from the United States and piling the company up with debt laying off a bunch of people, and finally laying me off, because they didn't need me anymore, I to move all the jobs to India. So I didn't, I didn't particularly like the way the private and public financing of companies worked. And towards the end of my career, I started looking at, why do we have laws that allow this and promote this kind of thing? Mm -hmm. This stuff is not helpful to our country. It's only helpful to a number, a small number of people who make a lot of money off of it. So that's how I got into this, by seeing that the laws in our country are, and policies in our country are not beneficial to our country, and uh, learning why and what we can do. So that, that, does that answer your question, sir? Yes, sir. How about you? Okay, so how did I get involved? My wife is a teacher. I was working from home when Sandy Hook happened, and I had a couple of kids, and I'm like, this is sick. So I, I started looking for what can I do. Moms Demand Action came along, somewhat unorganized. I started driving from Bloomingdale, where I was living, up to Hills, anywhere where I could get involved. 
um, right after uh, Parkland, I got a Moms Demand Action group started in Barrington, where I live. So we've got a group there. Um, then I saw what was happening with climate, and I got involved with climate groups. Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, Sierra Club, uh, our, our climate group that, that's part of uh, our, our organization. Um, and we just got a climate group started in Barrington. We lobbied the, the village uh, board of trustees every Monday night to set up a climate group to, to work on our uh, environment in, in the village. In May, they set one up. We just had a meeting uh, two weeks ago. So it can work, but what I tell people, it, 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 writing a letter, it's nice. You have to be in their face. You have to go and talk to them. As Ed said, meet with your, your legislators. Um, I've met with my legislators. Um, I've gone down to Springfield. Ed has gone down to Springfield for lobby day. But get involved. Now, if, if you guys have ideas on how we can tackle this money and politics issue, um, you guys get together every Saturday night. Think about it. Get back to us. You, you, you've got you've got our email. So uh, I mean, what we're trying to do is is get a grassroots effort started. Ed's been to Iowa to give this presentation. He's been to Texas to give this presentation. So if you have other organizations that we could do this at, just tell us. We'll we'll, you know, we'll work with you on, on getting getting a date scheduled. Okay, next question. Just call him. Yeah, sir. Yeah, um, to take HR1, uh, to take HR1 and, um, uh, and implement it here in the state of Illinois, uh, the part of HR1 that has to do with campaign financing, um, what would the, I mean, I know it's a complicated subject, but what would the, what would the restrictions uh, in campaign financing look like for, let's say, a, a state congressperson or uh, a, a, or an alderman? Well, the, uh, first of all, one of the most important things, one of the important things to do is, is, is just, you know what we're going to do? We're going to pass the mic around. That's how we're going to okay. handle questions. Okay. So, so um, Sorry, excuse me. The way the, con the, way the, the campaign finance stuff works is generally... Thanks. If you sign up for public financing of elections, you can't take uh, big donations at all. You can take small donations from individual um, individual voters, and then the government matches that stuff, seven to one, eight to one, something like that. And, and if you choose not to have that matching stuff, then you're in the old system, and you can take whatever you want. So that's how they do it in New York City, for example. And most people who run for city government positions in New York City take the public finance and they, they get a, they get some stuff going with some people they know and the government when they get to a certain level the government starts matching that for them the city government starts matching it for them and they build up enough money to run a campaign that way and when they what they say is that in their advertisers they say I'm not taking big money you can trust that I'm not going to be holding the big money because I'm taking money from you and I'm taking money from the city government that's matching your, your things. So, you know, sometimes some people run against them by taking the big money and sometimes they win, but most of the time they don't because the public has gotten used to the idea that if you're taking this big money, you're probably going to be corrupt and you're probably going to be holding to somebody. So they tend to vote for the person that's taking the public financing. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to pass on, but just one, one more quick question. The, like the $500 million that was spent by and, uh, the governor, the two governors that ran, you know, uh, Pritzker and uh, Rahner, um, it, it, it just so obscene, uh, and, and I, I assume there would be, uh, <laughs> there would be a change there with this implementation? Well, uh, you know, we have to, we have to figure it out. I can't yeah. sit here and say that I have all the answers for you. Certainly there's, there's more transparency. Let's just pass it along. Yeah, certainly there's issues of transparency, there's issues of, of, of public financing, what you can do if you take public financing, what you can't do if you take public financing. So um, that's that's about as much I can do right now. Okay, sir. thank you. Uh, best presentation I've seen here. Yeah, really wonderful. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Excellent. Next. Thank All right, Ellen. Yeah, hi. Thanks. Um, thank you, Dan. Yeah, I'm Ellen Corley, and I actually got started with Northwest Suburbs Organizing Fractions Fellows Group with um, 
Sarah and Bill Davis. Right, and, I went through that same thing. Right, yeah. So you, it was 2013, I think. But um, and we did gun violence, and then moved into. Um, I'm more into criminal justice reform now, mm -hmm. um, which they. I think you've got social, maybe you replace that with social justice now, or still does criminal justice reform? Do we have a social justice group? Yeah. Social justice. That was neat. Yeah. yeah, I. you know, so that's a new aspect of it. Um, did, did you have a question there? Well, yeah, the question is, um, yeah, uh, uh, gerrymandering, I guess it's kind of a suggestion with the, can you, can you, do you have any data showing the, uh, how, about gerrymandering here in Chicago and how that uh, has played out? I, I, I don't have much about, about gerrymandering in Chicago, but I do have a couple of slides in that area that um, are worth looking at. Let me, let me move up. Now, um, let me have the mic, because I want to, yeah. Let me have the mic, because I want to point at the screen when I'm talking. I'll turn, I'll turn the lights so, on. Uh, just, if you look at it, we look at this mostly at the national level because it impacts Congress uh, tremendously. Doesn't impact Senate because those are statewide races. Doesn't impact the President. It, it impacts the House of Representatives, and you see it, it. It works in both directions. There's there's um, states like California that are essentially gerrymandered in favor of the Democrats, and there's there are states like Texas that are gerrymandered in, in favor of the Republicans. Um, and, and this can become a contentious issue. Jim and I, we work with um, Democratic politicians a lot because we're progressives. And even though this presentation is apolitical, I mean, this presentation is generally well received by people on both sides of the aisle because nobody likes their, the, the idea that Congress doesn't care what we think. But we work a lot with, with um, Democratic politicians. And when we mention that, because we have a group that's working on gerrymandering, and we mentioned to them we're working on gerrymandering, and they say, shut up, don't do that. Gerrymandering is helping us here in this state. But, you know, so, so it's a hard thing to work on. But our, our opinion is if we're going to fix it, you got to fix it for both sides. But the interesting thing about all this is, is that um, in the House of Representatives, I don't know if I have a particular slide on this, but in the House of Representatives, after the, 26, after the 2018 election, you see, the way you measure the effect is, is you, you talk about a seat gap. You talk about how many people voted red versus blue, and how many seats in the legislature ended up red versus blue. For example, Wisconsin is the worst, the worst state in the nation about this. 60% of the state voted blue in their congressional um, race but in 2016, but because of gerrymandering, 60% of the seats are, are red. Yeah. So, so that's how you measure it. You measure the gap between how people voted and how the seats weren't up. Well, in the United States House of Representatives, after the 20th election, the seat gap is zero. The gerrymandering and the, and the, on the left completely canceled out the gerrymandering on the right. So, you know, it, it can be an important thing at a state level. Certainly it's an important thing for Wisconsin. And, and it's one of the reasons, it, it, in fact, it's one of the reasons that the Democrats are so strong in Illinois. But at the federal level, it's pretty much balancing out. So that, that's about most I have to say about it. Okay. And the fact that the Supreme Court case recently said they weren't going to make a decision, um, but they said... Get a better argument and come back to us. So that's something I'm looking for. Well, Eric Holder is working on this. How we could pitch something to the Supreme Court. Eric Holder is working on this, and, and just in case, you know, you were you went through the OFA program. OFA right now is gone. I don't know if you know this, but uh, part of Indivisible now. No, well, well, Northwest Suburban OFA joined Indivisible uh, just to have a backing organization, yeah. but the OFA organization has been rolled into Eric Han Eric Holder's anti gerrymandering. Yeah. Uh, project. So there's a lot of people working on gerrymandering. Okay, next question, please. Okay, can we get the lights back on, please? Oh, yeah, sure. yeah. All right, uh, hang on. Let me get a, a clear chance to get the lights back. Um, I know you answered this before, but how did the, how did this president become president? Because he didn't show his tax returns. How, how, how is that possible? Well, First of all, I, I don't think not showing his tax returns is, is why he became president, okay? I think the way he became president is that he lied to people 
about the ability to change the economic fortunes of the middle class. In my view, what we have in this country, and this is another completely thing I can get off on, in my view, what we have in this country is, is decades of trickle-down economics, which have created a very large uh, economic inequality, where very few people have most of the money, that damages our economy because it reduces consumer disposable income, and that holds back business growth. It damages our society because people get pissed off by it. And so then, if, when people are all angry, somebody could come along and say, you know, your problems are due to uh, immigrants, or, or bad trade deals, or too high taxes of job creators, when in fact our problems are due to trickle-down economics. So, I, the way he became president is he fooled people into thinking, and these are people in the Midwest who used to vote Democratic, but blue-collar workers and farmers in the Midwest bought his lies and voted for him. And I'm just hoping and praying and working, uh, uh, working to some extent to make sure they don't do it again. And, and the trade war is helping us along that road. Okay. The, <coughs> the, uh, it's impeachable. All right, yeah, let, let's. The Democrats are allowing 150,000 Ill illegal immigrants in yeah. every, every month, every yeah, month, 150,000. Eventually, they, the Democrats want them to vote like they're doing in California, yeah. illegal vote in California already. So, what do you think about that? I'll tell you what I think about that. Yeah, I think some, tell me. I think some of that is. I think some of that is nonsense. I don't think there's any illegal voting going out in California. I, there's no proof of that. None. They give them driver's license and then they give yeah. them voter voter they can vote. You get a driver's license here, but it's not a driver's license that enables you to register to vote. I'm talking California. Yes, sir. I'm aware of what's going on in California, and there's no illegal voting going on there. Why do they let these people in then? It's a myth. Uh, well, they let them in because business wants them in because business wants the cheap labor. What about New Hampshire? Yeah. And, and let, let, let's clarify. Let's clarify also. If they come in and ask for asylum, they are not illegal. You do understand that? Yes. Mike's going that way, sir. That, that's, 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 that's international law, and it's also U.S. law. So th uh, they, they've been branded by the current administration as being illegal. I also think it's pretty much off topic for this presentation. So well, voting rights. Voting rights. What about my rights? These people nullify my rights. No, no sir, because they're not the They're not the right. That's what you say. You are progressive. I can't believe you. Well, I'm sorry, sir, but I'm I am an expert on uh, on elections. I've studied elections inside and out. They're not voting. What about 163 million people who voted for for Trump, and and you guys are just for three years you're just uh, attacking yeah. them? What about that, progressive? What about that? Huh? I, I don't think that Trump's been attacked for anything he didn't do. I mean, Mueller, I, Mueller, they didn't find anything there. Excuse me, sir. They found plenty of evidence for obstruction of justice. They just didn't charge him because of the the DOG policy of not charging a sitting president. There's plenty of evidence for obstruction of justice. What about Biden? Okay, go ahead. Okay, next. Okay, next. Thank, 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 thank you. Let's next question, please. What about the uh, current governor? Uh, I'm not sure I know much about the current governor. He's quite a I know that he signed the gun dollar, the, the gun dealer licensing act on his fourth day in office. Mm -hmm. he, he, he signed it on his second day in office. Okay. I, I was there when he signed it. Okay. And uh, we knew that he was going to sign it. Um, we held it back from Ronner from, from legislative maneuvers. Two days after he was inaugurated on Tuesday, he signed it Thursday morning in Austin. So, so I don't know much about our governor, but I do know that if it takes a billionaire in this system, in this corrupt system, if it takes a billionaire to beat a billionaire, the Democrats had one, and they won. And, and they're, we're doing a bunch of decent things in our state because of that. Yeah, just just some, some other interesting things about J.B. Um, he, even before he got into politics, he started uh, a school breakfast for, for, for kids that didn't have breakfast. Okay, he did that on his own, and then he then he started a, a uh, uh, what was it uh, a in incubator, uh, a technology incubator group down in Chicago. He got that started, so he was already working for us to try to get stuff started. He gave okay. up a million dollars for the Center for Wrongful Convention convictions. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes. All right. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I was really impressed by the idea that you think uh, that the um, HR one should be divided into its particular issues. And uh, 
Well, Gwen Rauner was governor, um, so I guess that was probably the last five years. There was a law passed in Illinois called CJA, the, um, the Energy <coughs> Jobs Act, the something Energy Jobs Act, and um, uh, um, Future Energy Jobs Act. No, no, Fiji. Fiji. It hasn't been passed energy. yet. Uh, it hasn't been passed yet. It's no, I know. CJA that was passed. Yeah, CJA. And um, uh, when that law was in the legislature, it was a piece of sausage because the um, the the solar part, the wind part, the nuclear part, and the fossil fuel part were all mixed in, and it turned out that the nuclear uh, uh, the, the nuclear industry got a $2.3 billion subsidy because of their complaints that some of their um, nuclear plants were not making money. Then solar got something and wind got something, but very, very little. Is there a question here, ma'am? Yeah, there is a question. I'd like to know what you can do when you have a person like, um, oh, I've got to try to remember his name, Mike Madigan. Yeah. Uh, Mike Madigan in office and he demands that these issues not be voted on on their merits, but that they be put all together in one big mess and voted on as one thing. Well, he's, he's doing that. This, this seems to have quit working now. Uh, did you, did you? Uh, I didn't touch it. No, it's okay. I'll, 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 I'll just use this. Oh, okay. Um, Ma what? Madigan is an interesting fellow and um, he, he runs the legislature pretty much the same way, the same way McConnell runs the Senate, right? right? Yeah. yeah. So it's hard to get past him sometimes. But you can't all get... All the time. No, not all the time. We got past him on the gun violence stuff. We got three bills passed. And he supported them. He supported well, them. Well, yeah, he supports it. That's different. Well, that's the, well, there's no way out. You can't do anything without getting his support until we get rid of him. So, and, and by the way, we can get rid of them. Um, we can be friends with them. No, 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 no. Gonna I'm going to give you a little diversion here. I'm going to give you a pitch for ranked choice voting. If you don't know what ranked choice voting is, it's a way of voting where you get multiple choices. You say, I vote for this guy. But if he loses, I want this guy. And if he loses, I want this guy. You can do that as many as you want. You, you rank your people who you want. Now, the way a guy like Madigan stays in power, you know, he is a representative of a district that used to be all uh, Caucasian. And over decades, his district has become mostly Latino, yet he still gets elected in there. And the way he does it is when he gets an elect, uh, a, a Latino opponent, he goes out and he recruits four other, five other Latino candidates that get on the ballot too. So that when a, a Latino guy goes in the ballot, he sees five Latinos in Madigan, and he votes for one of the Latinos instead of Madigan. But he, because there's five Latinos, the Latino vote is all split up, and Madigan wins um, with the remaining white vote. If yeah. we had ranked choice voting, Latino would walk in there, and he'd vote for all five of those Latinos and not for Madigan. And those votes would all filter down to one of those guys eventually when, when they get eliminated, and Madigan would lose. So there are better forms of voting that stop politicians from playing games. But until we do that, we got to live with these guys. We got to find out a way to get past them, and that means getting the support you need of the people you need to convince him he's got to do it. I can't say anything else. Is that's how we did it, isn't it? Yeah. That, well, yeah, but he was also in favor of it. Well, not originally. Not when the NRA was in power. This is quick. I mean, you uh, you mentioned the website. You mentioned the website, uh, and I wrote down witness lips. Witness slips. W h i t n e s s. Witness S slips. Slips. Yeah. Dot and, and and com. Dot no, no. no, 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 no. If you, if you, if you, if what you, is it? If you Google um, Illinois witness slips, you can find the Illinois legislature website where you can, you can, and and you know what? Let me give you a card, and you can just email me, and I'll I'll help you find it because I don't have it off the top of my head. Okay. Let, 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 the, the next question was: yeah, Did let, let, you just say rank? Rank choice voting. Rank choice voting. R C V is is the the new voting style that a lot of people are pushing. 
Yes, ma'am. So, so if you had a public finance, public support of um, public finance of um, elections or of, would that force somebody to use their, to have, who pays taxes to support somebody that they were extremely opposed to? Well, it, it, maybe in a way it would because they'd be using our tax money to fund elections. So if some Republican signs up and gets, gets uh, matching funds, then yeah, some of our tax money is going to a Republican. Uh, so you, you could potentially make uh, extreme feminists support somebody who's anti-choice, or you can make somebody who is Jewish support somebody who's running for the Nationalist Socialist Party? Well, you know, I don't know how, how, how fair it is to think that way, because maybe a couple of pennies of your tax money it's, it's a couple of pennies from everybody. So, so if the idea is to have free and fair elections and to, to let anybody run, then yeah, maybe a couple of your pennies will go support somebody you don't like. I think it's still better than what we have now. Yeah, you, you, your candidate would get just as much money and eligible for just as much money as the candidate that you don't like. So that's how it becomes fair. Okay, and let me just talk to the witness slips. <clears throat> you have to be involved with an organization that is following the witness slips. Okay, we were with the gun violence groups, the gun violence coalition. Um, I mean, League of Women Voters did it, uh, Moms of End Action did it. You have about 24 hours when you find out when that bill is going to be in committee to get online and, and say whether you oppose or support a bill. And the way we do it is, the way we do it is through Facebook groups, you know? Right. I, I look at Facebook several times a day, and and when when Sarah sends out a note saying, time to send, send out your witness slips, and all of us see that, and get online overnight and submit our witness slips, and the next day the stuff is there for the legislator. But just, just one person by himself, I mean, I actually wrote, a, I'm a computer guy, so I wrote a program that would scan the, the congressional, uh, the Illinois congressional website and find all the bills that are up in committee. And I can put in keywords, I can put in keywords to look for bills for gun violence, for example. And even then, you see 50 bills, you don't know which ones are the important ones. You gotta be hooked into somebody who's, who's really hooked into the state legislature on your issues to know when it's time to get out your torches and pitchforks and, and wave them at the, at the legislators. Other questions? Let's go back here. All right. Oh. Well, I've heard you gentlemen say you use the term free and fair uh, multiple number of times. I've heard you use the term free and fair multiple number of times. Yet, I know that there's a reference book, the Encyclopedia of Association. There are literally hundreds of, there's thousands of associations in the United States and you want to differentiate among those that you approve of and don't approve. I mean, if an industry or occupations, what have you, form an association of individuals to advance whatever issue, why should they pre be precluded from doing so? Okay. I'm sorry, I don't remember saying that lobbying should be illegal. I don't think it should be illegal. I think that people who want to get together and promote something should be allowed to do that. However, if you look at what's happening here in this country right now, the people who have tons of money are using it to get the laws and policies that support them. Most of the money spent on lobbying comes from business organizations. Yes, the thing said, every trade group, every union, every special interest group, that's all true, all those people can lobby. But the vast majority of the money is coming from um, um, large businesses. Uh, when you add, you look at trade unions and special interest groups, they have nowhere near the financial clout that these large corporations have. So it's not an issue of shutting anybody up, it's an issue of restricting how, how they can use their money. How much money can they throw at this? Is money free speech? Do corporations vote? Why do we let corporations act as participants in our political dialogue, using their money as an enormous megaphone, megaphone that shouts down everybody else when they don't even vote? 
So the idea of limiting the amount of money that can be spent levels the playing field for all these groups so that you won't have a few groups that call all the shots and everybody else is drowned out. Uh, no, nobody says lobbying should be illegal, sir. Sure, and you gave me a yes but answer. I gave you my answer. Sir. Yes but. <laughs> I found the, yes, uh, your video, the first one on why I should be involved in politics, it was unconvincing. Uh, what, what difference will it make if I get involved in city, state, or county politics? I'm only one little one little guy. Well, I'll answer that, sir. One little guy. I'll answer that, sir. I'm just one little guy. He's just one little guy. But him and I and tens of thousands other little guys made some stuff happen in Illinois here where we passed we passed laws which the NRA vehemently opposed and which the NRA has been able to stop for decades. So one little guy along with a whole bunch of other little guys, can actually do something. But unless all those little guys do something, nothing's going to happen. So, so I think that, that it's up to us to, to get together and do some stuff, and not just to say, oh, I'm just one little guy, what can I do? I, I, I don't buy that. Let's go over here. Okay. Yep. Thank you. you. You said that the... Equal Rights Amendment is only one state away from adoption. I read the paper all the time. I never, I never see that. Yeah. Well, okay. So, so yeah. here's, the, here's the exact truth about that. Uh, I, you know, I was looking at this the other day because I was trying to show people how hard it is to pass an amendment, and I looked up a list of, of failed amendments, amendments that have been proposed and 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 are not in the Constitution. A long time ago, amendments didn't used to have some kind of time limit on their ratification. So there was a bunch of amendments back from the early 1900s, which are still out there and could be ratified if the states wanted to, and they're still open for, for ratification. But around 1950 or 60 or so, they started putting time limits on the ratification process. So if, if a thing isn't ratified within a set number of years, it's considered defeated, and, and it's not, no longer open for ratification. So the Equal Rights, equal rights Amendment, um, it, it did not become ratified by three-quarters states before its time limit elapsed. But that didn't stop some states from going ahead and ratifying it anyway. And about two years ago, Illinois ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. Because of a lot of women's groups lobbying, not with money, but lobbying their legislators to make it happen. So at this point, we are one state away from ratifying it. Now, if we get one more state, we're going to have to go to court and say, well, that whole idea of a, of a time limit is nonsense, and we want, we want it to go into effect anyway. But it, it, did, it did get passed here in Illinois a couple of years ago, and I'm, I'm sorry that it didn't get enough press for you to see it, sir, but it, that did happen. Okay, other questions? I got one. Okay. One, one is, uh, to, to what extent is have an idea for a women's party as a third party, you know, to try to really capture, because I think they're concerned about um, question, corruption. Please. And the, the other, you know, the question, question. is, okay, I have, um, do you have any ideas about how finding things illegal, I mean, I'm a researcher, can you dig into, you know, the Citizens United was pushed in through uh, lobbying and through the CIA and the judges and you know exposing the corruption to me anti-corruption is an issue we all agree on and maybe that name ought to be on top of HR1 because we don't know what that is yeah. no, I agree that HR1 is a crappy name um, I, I want to back up to something you said about a third party I want you all to understand that our Constitution implicitly requires us to be a two-party system I will tell you why Right now, in the Electoral College, the winner has to have a clear majority. He's got to have 270 votes. If we had three strong parties and nobody got a clear majority, the vote would be ignored. The popular vote would be completely ignored, and the House of Representatives would choose the president with one vote for each state. Now, this 
is not something we want to have happen. We don't want the popular vote to be ignored. We can't have more than two parties until we change our constitution or, or get rid of the electoral college through the NPVIC thing. And so the, the talk about a third party, I think, is by people who don't understand our constitution and don't understand how terrible it would be if we had three real parties right now. Personally, I think we should just take over the Democratic Party, make it what we want, and and be done with it. So, so that's that's that. Now, the other question you asked was about how we can find corruption. Yeah, I don't think it there's any problems finding corruption. <laughs> well, and demand they act on it, they prosecute and investigate. Sure, themselves. sure. Well, that, that was the, the the gist of my whole talk. We can't get Congress to do it, so we start We start lower. We, we do it in the city level. We do it at the state level. If enough states do it, the federal government will do it too, but only after 30 states do it, 35 states do it. The, the Federalist Society has pushed it to the states. I think it should be at the federal level. Uh, how are you going to need Congress to do that? Well, I mean, push them, yeah. You know, really expose them, embarrass them. Well, it, 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 I suppose it might be possible, but it's a lot easier to do stuff at the state level. And in fact, all the major things we did happened in all the states first. Uh, you wanted the election, the national election, to be based yeah. on the national popular vote. Uh, and, um, is that really in the best interest for people who live in the Midwest, uh, including people who live in what would make a politician go to Wisconsin or North Dakota or Iowa? You want a democracy or not? Right now, a voter in Wyoming has almost four times the weight of a voter in California when it comes to electing our president. Somebody's got the idea that their vote should count more because they live in a low population state? That doesn't make any sense. Look, if your concern is protecting the rights of some minority, and in this case the minority we're talking about is rural voters, because right now, 80% of the people live in urban areas and 20% of the people live in, in rural areas. If you're worried about protecting the rights of these people, you don't do it by giving them outsized political power. You don't avoid a tyranny of the majority by creating a tyranny of the minority. Right now, we have a tyranny of the minority. I can't get federal gun laws passed in Congress because the rural people have so much political power, even though they're only 20% of the population. The Senate, the, the Senate, 50% of the senators are elected by 17% of the population. You see, in this Constitution, we don't and should not be protecting minority rights by giving them outsized political power. We should be protecting minority rights with the Bill of Rights. That's why we have the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is there to make sure we don't have a tyranny of the majority. The majority can't vote for just anything they want. They can't vote for something that violates the Bill of Rights. So the right way to protect the minority is the Bill of Rights, not giving an outsized political power. And I am personally sure that we'd have a better country if everybody's vote counted equally. I'm gonna get her first. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, what do you think about the idea yes, um, that I've heard that um, the framers wanted gridlock? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. talks about that. Uh, I don't know about that. I think, I think you, you, I think that the framers were, were stuck with a difficult situation and they needed to compromise. They had a bunch of individual states that were independent they were in a loose confederation. It wasn't working very well. They had to find a way to talk him into a, a, a tighter uh, federation of some kind. And the, the, the structure of Congress does that because it has a somewhat uh, a body in the House that is somewhat representative of the population. You remember, back 200 years ago, we didn't have 80% urban, 20% rural. It was the other way around. We had 80% rural and 20% urban. So this problem of, of rural states having outsized power uh, uh, as opposed to urban areas wasn't is anywhere near as big as it is now. But so we had a house that's pretty proportional to the population, and then we had a Senate that represented this, 
states' rights, which is how we got the states to agree to form the union under the Constitution. Now, that compromise is hurting us badly now because we have a government that is not proportional to the population. And as I just mentioned, 17% of the population elects 50% of the senators. <coughs> so uh, the trouble, so I don't think they wanted gridlock, but I think they inadvertently built something that 200 years later has gridlock, and it's really difficult to change. Yeah, let, let me add something. To that. Yeah, add something. Um, regarding gridlock, I was at a uh, seminar a couple weeks ago, a uh, financial seminar, and they said, Wall Street loves gridlock. Why? Because they know nothing is going to happen that's going to upset them. So money and politics may have something to do with the gridlock that you're seeing. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. He's got questions. It's my trouble. Should they abolish the Electoral College? Yeah, absolutely. This they do it? Pop -pop well, we've got, we've got two amendments in, in the House right now that passed the House. They'll never get past the Senate. We'll trying to now. do that. And then, you know. Why not? Yeah. Well, because, because the rural states, so like the rural states, have outsized political power. Mm -hmm. This thing about NPVIC that different states opt into, Nevada opted into it. Nevada legislature is a Democratic legislature with a Democratic uh, governor. Nevada voted to join NPVIC, and the governor vetoed it. The blue governor vetoed it because he says, my rural state has more power in this country because of the, the, the uh, electoral college, and I don't think we should give up that power. So the, the, the rural folks like the fact that they have outsized political power, and that's going to make it very hard for us to get rid of it. Did you have a question? Um, he did. He Pat, did. Pat, 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 Pat Butler did. Uh, actually, my uh, question was uh, asked by the gentleman over there. Uh, okay. okay, then David Zucker. Yeah. Did you have oh. all? All right. So I, yeah, it isn't I? I know for a fact that the nonprofits, uh, a good many of them, uh, have paid professional lobbyists in the state legislature already, <coughs> and isn't this kind of like a scheme to? turn power over to about a dozen of these, of course, let's say well-intentioned, but nevertheless, uh, I'd say there's about a dozen statewide organizations that uh, want to advance their own issues. Well, I think that's true. Uh, first of all, let me say that if you're curious, if you want to know the truth about who spends money, of influencing what oh, he's politicians. Having problems. There's a, a website you go you can go to called opensecrets.org. Open secrets. One two words butted together dot org. And in there you will find summaries of all the campaign finance disclosures that every different organization every different politician has to file as to where he's getting his money. And you can see who's putting the money in. And when I say that most of the money comes from big business. It's because I looked at that stuff. I added it up. I categorized it as business versus union versus special interest. And I saw that 90% of the money was coming from business. So, so yeah, you know, there are some organizations that, that push their, their goals, like the NRA pushes freedom to have any weapon you want, and Moms Demand Action pushes uh, freedom to go to school without being shot. And, and I don't have a problem with organizations pushing their point of view. And if, if you think that there should be some other organization pushing your point of view, go start one. Go find one. Donate to them. Um, build a group. Yep. So that's this is how our democracy okay. works. And, and it, I just don't want to see money okay. being unlimited because that just means that some groups can shout down others completely. All right, last question. Last question. Right. Make it good. I, I want you to run. But you would be perfect because you teach and you're active and you all that. And I'm 70 years old and I don't want to run. Oh, I want to do this. Yeah, yeah. No run. No. Okay. Yeah. No, not for me. Not for me. Uh, all right. Maybe maybe Jim. You want to run? Yeah. No, I, I don't want to run. But, but let me <laughs> add, uh, to what, what Ed just said about joining an organization. Key to remember is democracy is not a spectator sport. There you go. If you guys are going to sit here and complain, it's not going to do any good. You have to get involved. Yeah, run. <laughs> run for office.
just it's not just both, win. but it's find the guys that you that you support. You know, I went out. I, I live in Morton Grove, but I went out to uh, uh, DuPage County to to canvas for Sean Caston because I wanted to turn that district from red to blue. And this year, we're going to Wisconsin to try and help make sure that that state doesn't revert. They just they just voted for a Democratic governor, but not by much. He didn't win by a lot. We got to make sure that, that that state votes the right way uh, next year. Get active. Go go spend your time. Donate some money. Find the guys that, that have the platforms you want and support them. It's, do that as well as voting. And, and also, you know, get everybody to vote. Get everybody registered and all that good stuff. Is there a way to get people in those red states oh, right. to run, get blue, support blue people in red states? I think we're done. Yeah. Well, any, anyway, um, what uh, at, at this point we're going to rebuttals. Uh, if you guys don't mind, you see where that pen is at? The microphone will fit right in there. Uh, how many people have rebuttals tonight? Okay, we'll go about uh, a soft six minutes each. You do realize that we have to be out by 8.30, 8.45. That'll give our speakers plenty of time to uh, do various things. Uh, let's uh, get rebuttals up there. Let's get a hand for our speakers tonight, please. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, let's get, uh, you guys know the drill on deck chairs. Uh, we're, it's a soft six minutes, so, you know, if you can do it, you can do it. We'll be keeping time as normal, and uh, don't bloviate. Just uh, be succinct. Somebody turned off my amplifier. Is the battery driven? Battery driven. Oh. 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 O
the people have no power in a police state, you know, and especially when the police state controls the media and says that the people, um, you know, denies that they're, they blame it on the other guy, blame it on the Russians, blame it on the Democrats, blame it on the Republicans. We're, we're divided and conquered. And so what I say is we're not represented. They, I'm a market researcher. I think we need, you know, your ideas are right that it needs representative government, but what we have is feudalism. We have a top-down, uh, if you look back on history, I, my ancestors, it turns out, came over to Jamestown on the same boat, and they were, um, they were fleeing monarchy. And, um, you know, the fact this battle between cousins of, you know, cutting off each other's heads, that's what we've got, you know, and um, it's a winner take all. You get all the money, all the laws, all the, you know, and that's why there's so few non-issues that get, get passed, you know. Um, what concerns me with the democratic process, and even this, I worked on the gun violence, the reason I moved off it is because, it, you know, just one state with one law, you know, it's, um, it just doesn't work, right? And I think it's kind of convenient, you know, that's that 30%, they pick the wedge issues that pisses off the gun owners and, and pisses, separate the moms from the red from the dads basically you know and you, you end up like every family these are non-issues abortion who cares at this stage right you know between most of us and you're going to divide everybody up that's what we get I, if you're going to do ranked choice let's do it with a survey on real issues i did read 79 percent of people are um one of those issues uh that you talked about i Corruption, I forget it, you know, it, and it's shocking that they don't listen. But I, I definitely agree we have to go talk to them. Um, that's what I've learned. We have to lobby. I, you know, protesting is frustrating and painful, but I'm glad that the Black Lives Matter and all those guys are doing it. I, I'm standing there with them. What I'm trying to control is the media and the message by exposing these things. What gets me is, you, you know, there's... Edward Snowden, you know, reveals the fact that they're looking at us and listening to us and this whole system, Facebook and, and Cambridge Analytica and Paladin, which was stolen by Pollard and covered up by our government and using our technology, our CIA, our military budget to control us and, and blame it on the Russians or the you know, Democrats or whoever, we we have a police state and that has to be stopped. And there were laws that they threw out. The Citizen Protection Act um, was required lawyers to be ethical. They threw it out. They said, oh, it didn't pass, you know, between the versions were different in the houses, even though they passed by large majorities. These little tricks, throwing out honest services laws, saying everything is at the state level. This, is, this was a deliberate plan by the Federalist Society. It was by the Federalist Party under Jefferson and Hamilton. Hamilton was the Federalist, Jefferson was the Anti-Federalist. And Hamilton had, took all the money from the bankers and the billionaires for, for forever war, and they, they know how to use spies and agents and, then, and propaganda and lies. Two minutes more? Or, or just if you're ready to wrap up, please. What time, how much have I spent? We weren't, we weren't, kept, we weren't keeping it actually, so just. You weren't keeping it, okay. Just, All right, um, yeah, the, the main idea is we need investigation and prosecution and regulation. And my complaint with the Honest Service, with the um, Citizens United is disastrous. I would like to expose how it happened, but what what it is, is it, they use the propaganda. People don't know, Citizens United were the same ones that made the Willie Horton ads. This was Nixonite propaganda machines that we have, you know, honest truth in advertising. You know, they had the fairness doctrine is the most important thing, thrown out in the 80s by the Nixonite Federalists that said that the, it used to be the broadcast media had to be answerable to the public interest. 
They, the stupid disc jockey that Reagan put in under Casey, who was also CIA, corrupt OSS, Nazi, it, but they put in this law, they say, throw that out because we've got competition now that we've got cable. Well, obviously, cable TV is not competition, and we don't have the public interest being represented in the media. Without the media, we've got a dumbed-down populace, and we're going to lose no matter what. Okay, thank you. All right, next. Yes. All right. All right. Uh, Next. Who's rebutting next? Ed Butler, get up there. Me? I yes, you always got a good rebuttal. Uh, okay, I'll. <clears throat> Tell us about your ancestors, Pat. All right, Pat, uh, hurry up. Sophie. You mean my cousins Sophie. over here? Sophie. <laughs> Seriously, folks. Uh, I've long wondered why. We keep something as archaic and meaningless uh, as the uh, electoral college. Electoral college. Um, it may have made sense, and I doubt it, 250 years ago. But today, can anyone here offer any reason for it today? Originally. The Electoral College was designed, let's be honest, it was designed to keep the riffraff, that was most of us, from having too much of a say in government. Um, now, of course, we have in some cases the riffraff running government, but it's not the same kind of riffraff that most of us would, would associate with. I really think that uh, in order to make our system work as it should, we ought to seriously think of scrapping the Electoral College. The Electoral College gave us what we have in Washington right now. Do we want that to happen again and again and again? They have to try to. I think not. I think we need to take a careful look at what may have made sense 250 years ago, but I doubt it. And we ought to seriously think of scrapping what has become an archaic and indeed perhaps dangerous uh, system. And uh, that's really... That's really all I've got to say because I really think that that's probably one of the important issues that we just will not talk about for one reason or another, but it's there. And we need to deal with it sooner rather than later. Thank you. Next. Come on, it's next trip butter. David, you've always got something. An extra butter, please. This is crazy. Nobody wants to say anything. All right. I think what we had tonight was one of the most informative and most, uh, I'd say, educational sessions on political activism that I've heard. Yes. I've never heard, even this is the first time I've heard about that. What you call the the, the witness slips? The witness slips, because I know that uh, I was just at a conference this week myself for the Thorium Energy Alliance, which is a way, new way of doing nuclear power. But a lot of the things that were there were for ten years. They were trying to get some bills passed in Congress through the Department of Energy, trying to deal with the uh, rare earth and thorium issue. <laughs> and getting a simple repository for uh, a certain amount of uh, thorium to be put into a, a, a storage area, secure and highly uh, effective, and that they've been trying for 10 years in some ways to get this bill passed. And it does have the, uh, an overwhelming majority with most of the people who are familiar with the issue. That's a federal bill, sir? It's a federal bill. Yeah, the witness slips are only for Illinois. I, I understand that. Um, but what, what makes me, what, what really 
was eye opening to me was just the 30 percent across the board until we get some more activism involved and how it's actually done as you said you guys had proceeded on both sides of the issue you both had uh, said it was both equally received from both conservative and progressive circles to be honest with you I am very uh, overwhelmed to see this meaning that uh, I, I honestly was wasn't convinced that the only really way you could make effective change in Washington was through the getting money into the system and not in the way that activisms can do and it in a sense does restore my faith in in the political process I know myself I get way too busy to even start considering getting active in politics with some of the civic organizations I'm involved with and my work and other stuff along those lines but I can do some things by at least looking on the internet and doing a few other things and maybe making some presentations on my own cause to some other organizations. Uh, with that, I'm going to cut it short. Let's get an next rebutter up here, please. Charlie, come on up. We'll give, we'll give, you, a little, we'll give you a little bit of extended time. Karina, you always got well, something to say. Nice of you. Normally you tell me, to, who do, come on, come in. Come on, Charlie, you've yeah, got some time. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Hello, V808, Charlie. You got right. a few minutes. I want to thank uh, both our speakers for, in two respects, uh, your presentation tonight and, uh, and your efforts on, on, on reforming government at the federal, state, and local level. Uh, I'm always in favor of reform. But no, uh, yeah, there are some things that perhaps we could level the playing field a little bit on, but. Anyhow, I'll be eclectic here as usual. Um, I really don't know the details about the Snowden guy. I do know the details of government records being in charge of them. And uh, I also know a lot about whistleblowers. But I'll tell you one thing though, a whistleblower doesn't take government records and that he's given in confidence and entrusted with and and uh, violate that trust in a wholesale fashion claiming that there's some higher good that's achieved when there's harm that comes to co-workers of, of mine and then they claim that he's a hero. I, any whistleblower comes to me and says so they want to take government records and use them improperly. You know what I say? I, I tell them, you get out of my office now, and I would prefer not to have anything to do with you ever again. Now, if you can't conduct yourself in appropriate fashion within the guidelines of exposing government improprieties, then I got to wonder what's going on here. I've assisted many whistleblowers in, in pursuing their complaints or, or their actions, and we didn't have to engage in any activity that was not in full compliance with the law, rules, and regulations of the government of the United States. Now, if you got to do something that violates one of those law, rules, or regulation, I got to say maybe you got to get a new procedure. Or maybe you ought to stop a minute and think about what you're doing. Or maybe you ought to do something to think about it a minute. Because there's nothing that requires or necessitates or justifies it. Anyhow, that's enough of that. But I don't know about it. I, I do know that that you can achieve what you want within the within the things and at least get the the uh, cause some discomfort uh, for those above you. Now, regarding the CIA, I've been hearing this, that the CIA is doing this and that, and I don't know, I, I, if you behave yourself, the CIA doesn't seem to bother anybody. <laughs> I don't they just murdered me. You, you <laughs> know, doesn't bother. I was, honestly, was the last time I, we had complaints, Some, I heard somebody complain about the CIA, you know, I mean, honestly. 
What Keep is this? Keep your code of silence, no problem. <laughs> hey, if you are a good citizen, go about your you business. You know, you can even have formulate your opinions. You know, you can vote this way or that way. You know, and no one bothers you. So I don't know what the issue is about that. Now, lobbyists. Yes, it's it perhaps some way uh, it's a checkbook based policy. There's certainly a lot of money floating around. Uh, the uh, people are using money, of course, as influence. It's, it's, people want to balance and counter that with perhaps the righteousness of their issue or the numbers. So it's kind of a contest in progress here. Okay, guys. Uh, you know, certainly the, the, given the social stratification of the United States and the 1% having undue influence over the affairs of the government, actually the concern of the, the founding fathers was that the 99% the would have too much influence. Actually, this is actually true. And any number of historians will verify this. They were really afraid of the 99%. Because they said the 99% would vote legislation totally a benefit to themselves. And they tried to put checks on it. And this is why you have something like, as he began correctly, representative government. They were fearful, and they called, used the term, the mob, if you wish, or the masses, would be a, a more gentler term. But now, it's oddly enough, we hear complaints that the 1% are intact, and he has seen by the graphs here, of uh, determining what the policies and practices of our government will be. And yeah, there can be no argument that there shouldn't be some balance in, in the process that all we can participate. Um, Regarding witness discipline, I don't know the answer to this, and I kind of forget, and I get many, I've got so many of these witness slips, being in organizations. You know, I, do you guys know what the value of a testimony, I guess it depends on how many hand them in. That's exactly right. When the reason we got a lot of gun violence stuff passed is because we got a lot of witness No, no, no. A signature on a petition is worth like one vote. Uh, a letter, a form letter sent in is a couple of votes. A personal letter is eight votes. That's what I'm talking about. I don't know what the quantification is on a witness slip. It's a new form of voicing your opinions. It's, it's, at, it's at the committee level. They just look at how many support. Yeah, but no, no, listen. In the real world, in an office of an elected official, puts weights on like a call to a call to an office on an issue is given given so much weight. This is where even your things about your associations is that you and, and to counter your presentation, the weight of an association uh, can bat, can counter money. And very well easily. I've been doing it for many, many years, the U.S. Congress, because I'm the guy without money. Uh, and they come in and what, and I actually have done this, curtailed the information on how many voters I have in each district and things of that nature. I spent last time around $2,000 printing literature. So that I could say I have people in each of the districts, um, like the like the Illinois delegation. I used to do, still do six states. So they asked me to say, well, how many people do you represent? You know, in Illinois, I say 142,000. You know, and I give these figures. And in your district, I usually have it figured out ahead of time before I go in, because I don't have a checkbook. I got one, but not, not enough to equal the big shots, by no means, you know. But uh, that's what you got to do. You got to wheel and deal. Uh, it, it, you can get it. You can succeed. It's not a hopeless situation. 
Um, much simpler, yes. Uh, the industry trade associations are going to have some money. That's the capitalists, you know, uh, are uh, doing it. Uh, if, if if you if you want to uh, carry it even one step further here, this checkbook kind of kind of I used to call it like in foreign affairs. You probably heard the expression checkbook diplomacy. Some of what the president was doing this week. Uh, and in, to some, I don't want to sound Republican, but yes, in the past, uh, money was used to get things, foreign governments to cooperate. Now, that didn't mean securing information on your political opponents. I mean, basically, Kissinger and Ket checkbook diplomacy, he would take these diplomats or rulers or presidents of other countries, his expression was he would take them shopping. But he certainly, depending on what you're asking for, there are limits and, and ethical limits to what you can extract and for what purposes. Uh, uh, that was definitely the case. Anyhow, you guys look like you're getting into a lot of good areas here. You have a lot of fun at it, and that's very good. You're shaking things up a little bit, you know. Um, it's a it's it's a system that's entrenched uh, over many years, especially at the federal level. Perhaps at the state, there's some more flexibility. Uh, I don't know what's going on with the CD. If there's ever been any standard operating procedures uh, for those guys, but uh, yeah, it's it's discouraging in one respect. But you uh, do the best you can to represent. Uh, the people you you do and on the issues that you're trying to advance. Anyhow, thank you very much. Come again, guys. Give us a report. All right, now, I, we're, we're, yeah, um, and I'm going to lobby for Thorium, okay. you know. Anybody, any uh, other rebuttals? That's a tough one. If not, our speakers get the final word. Take yeah. it up, and uh, both your guys get a chance to rebut the rebutters, and... Set the record straight. I want a lot of story. <laughs> I have a couple of comments based on the, uh, the last speaker. One is I do agree that we can overcome the power of money with votes if we get enough votes. Uh, it can be done. It's very tough at the federal level. But we know we can do it at the state level, and we can certainly do it at the city level as well. So I do agree that organizing is important, and it can work, and it can overcome the power of money. We've done it in a few areas, gun violence pre prevention specifically. Now I'll make, a, I'll make another comment about um, checkbook diplomacy. It is true that our government uses uh, military aid and foreign aid to influence other countries to do what we want them to do. We've always done that. But when we do that, we usually do it in conjunction with allies who share our worldview, and we do it in order to get countries to do things that are in our national interest. That's just part of diplomacy. Um, when we do it, when somebody does it for their own political purposes, that's different. So, I want to find something and read it to you that I saw today um, on the news. Let's see if I can find it quickly. Here, I can find it this way. I gotta go look at my at my profile. Well, I can't find it, but I'm gonna tell you what it says. It says, this is a guy, his name is Tucker Carlson. If you know who Tucker Carlson is, he's an enormous Trump supporter. He said today that when he sees our politicians using our foreign aid, our military aid, and our diplomatic capabilities to pursue their political objectives instead of the nation's objectives, that we've just become as corrupt as any other corrupt country in the world. And America should be better than that. And you're hearing that from Tucker Carlson, I'll mind you. So, uh, checkbook diplomacy is a fine thing when we use it in our national interest. And it's grounds for impeachment. 
when we use it for our political purposes. That, that, that's, that's, that's what I got to say. I want to thank you all for your time. I really appreciate your comments and your questions because every time I get good comments and good questions, it helps me do a better job of presenting the material. Thank you very much. Jim, what else do you want to say? Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say thanks to everybody for coming. And like we said, get in, getting involved, first step is coming to these meetings. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Devil us out. Just to say we're adjourned. Have a good adjourned. night, and we'll uh, see you all next week in another episode of the College of Complexes. Very good. Thank you all. Good night. All right. Thank you.